Hey, hey, fabulous. Welcome to She Commands the Stage podcast. My name is Chila and I am your host. I am so excited to be here with you, especially that I get to bring the joy bringer. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jen. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me. I am thrilled to be here. I absolutely loved reading that on your website. And I was like, totally fits her. Anytime <laughs> I've been around you, you just bring so much joy into the room. You have so much positive energy and I, I cannot wait to share you with my audience. So thanks for being here. I am thrilled. I'm, I'm glad that is also your experience. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Every time. So, um, you, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a little time to introduce yourself. Um, but when I think of you, I think of three things. I think of Enneagram, I think of leadership and conflict resolution, <laughs> and I think of magnetic speaker. I've seen some of your um, stuff online and you're just such an engaging speaker. But today I'm especially excited because we get to talk about two of my favorite topics, <laughs> um, Enneagram and speaking, right? And how to determine your style of speaking according to your Enneagram number. And before I had get ahead of myself, um, I just want to give you a moment to tell us a little bit about who you are. You can share whatever you wish to share about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I'm really glad that your three things match what I want to put out in the world. So that's good. <laughs> good, good, good. You're doing a good job. Yeah, so um, as Sheila said, I'm Jen Whitmer, and I really love helping teams and leaders solve conflict, cultivate good communication, and create empowered teams. So everybody walks away, not only getting their work done, but really flourishing in their whole lives. So that's the work that I do. And as Chila said, I am a speaker. So I do that through keynotes and workshops and breakouts and um, all of that kind of work, but I'm also a coach. And so I run a small cohort of women leaders called the Catalyst Leadership Lab and helping women in that group environment, move to that flourishing space as leaders and hopefully help their teams do the same. So that is the work that I do. I grew up in education. And um, so I was a teacher and a school leader and was in the world of education for 20 years and had a really awful, um, awful toxic work environment that sent mm. me out into figuring out how do we make that not happen again? And so that's where I've done all this work and study in conflict resolution and the Enneagram and how do we help teams not live in that crisis languishing state, but really move into positive, healthy environments. Mm. I can only imagine how many different companies probably need <laughs> your services. I just think of my husband, just like the work environment that he is in sometimes can tend to be quite toxic. And um, I definitely think that a lot of people need what you have to offer. So I hate um, that that is true, but I am glad that I get to help. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you're doing amazing, amazing work. Um, that's very helpful. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, okay. So as I mentioned in the introduction, two favorite topics that we're going to be talking about, Enneagram and speaking. So if there is anyone that's been kind of living under a rock, <laughs> haven't heard of the word Enneagram, which again, I know I'm too much into it. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that don't know and don't care about personality tests and all of that stuff. But I would love for you to tell us a little bit about what is the Enneagram. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're one of those people and you're like, any of what? And this is the mm -hmm. first time you've heard those syllables in that order. No shame. <laughs> it's totally fine. You are not alone. Absolutely. Um, and so the Enneagram is a personality framework and it really helps us see the deep motivations of why we think, act, and feel the way we do. And so it's slightly different than other personality frameworks. It's not just an assessment. It's really a system of how we figure out our internal world and how mm -hmm. does that show up externally? A lot mm -hmm. of personality frameworks only deal with the external and they're mm -hmm. not looking at the deep motivations. And so that's why I love using it. It's the one tool that I found to be the most effective in actually bringing change. I used to teach mm -hmm. and use a, a few other personality assessments and tools, and they're still great. They still offer us so much. Uh, mm -hmm. I just think the Enneagram is the one that provides the depth that really gets us what we want, which is why do I keep doing this? And how do I figure out not to do it anymore? Mm -hmm. And so that's mm -hmm. where I, what I love about the Enneagram. 
Yes. Yeah. And you kind of already touched on it. Um, but how is it different from like, let's say Myers-Briggs or um, strength finders or is yeah, it the absolutely. motivation or is it something else too? No, that's really the, the core difference is that motivation. And the way I like to describe it is um, strengths finders is like, if you imagine a pyramid, strength finders is like the top little triangle at mm-hmm. the top of the pyramid. It's what we, when we start to look at ourselves, it's the easiest ones to see like, oh, I'm really good at communicating. I'm good at strategy. Mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. um, I really do draw people in, you know, those, those strengths. And you start looking down the 35, you're like, oh yeah, I'm not very good at input or whatever, you know? <laughs> so that's the top. And then underneath that, um, we have our preferences and that's where Myers-Briggs li- lives. We prefer, I prefer using my right hand. I absolutely can eat and write with my left hand. I'm not totally ambidextrous, but mm-hmm. <laughs> but I still, if I'm going to go pick up a pen, I'm always going to prefer my right. Mm-hmm. And those are our preferences. And then we also have our patterns, the patterns of behavior. And that is where like DISC and Colby come in. This is our typical pattern of behavior. But so we've got our strengths and then we've got our patterns and then we have our preferences. But why do those things exist to begin with? Mm -hmm. And that's why the Enneagram is such a powerful tool because it shows us these deep motivations. And as we go through the podcast today, I will explain the nine types uh, Mm -hmm. because there are nine different types and and what motivates each of them. But as we're talking about that, we'll notice that all these motivations live within us, but one of them is the one that's really driving. It's like Mm -hmm. all of them are on the bus, but one of them is the bus driver and we Mm -hmm. figure out what that one is. And that's how we then start to figure out, oh, not only is that my type, but that's why I feel think and act this way. That's why I've made this preference over time. That's why this is my pattern. And even I got real good at it. And that's why mm-hmm. it's my strength. So they yeah. all work together. But when we start looking at the parts of ourselves, we don't like mm-hmm. that's where we grow. And that's why it's really helpful to mm-hmm. understand your deep core motivations of your Enneagram type. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. And I think, I mean, first of all, I'm a personality test junkie. <laughs> so oh. it's like taking I mean, is there a BuzzFeed quiz? Let me take it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, but I remember when I took uh, the first Enneagram test that I felt like it, it was the most comprehensive in the sense that, as you said, it looked not only at my strengths, but where am I when I'm not in a healthy space and how do I start behaving and what is the motivation behind it? And it was quite fascinating. Another thing that I remember taking um, the test and I was so against my number. <laughs> Does that happen to people where it's like, no, no, this is not me. And then I took it like three times and every time the same number came up. <laughs> what did you, when you say that, cause it's a super common experience. I would love for you to say why you were like, no, no, not me, not me. What was, what was that about? Okay. So I'm a three on the uh-huh. Enneagram, which I, I guess in some books are called achiever, another one, the performer or whatever. Mm-hmm. Bottom line is that I'm very much like performance driven, right? Like mm-hmm. goal setting and all of that. When I read the description of it, to me, it felt like it was someone who was very surface level and shallow. (laughs) It's just like, I'm not that. I refuse to believe that I am that. (laughs) But then the more I dug in, I realized, you know, that there is a continuum on all of them. And again, are you in a healthy space? Are you not in a healthy space? And so it did definitely change my mind. But um, I was just curious if if it's something where people are like, no. (laughs) I would say probably 90% of the time when people discover their Enneagram type, that is their common emotion Mm -hmm. of like, oh, no, 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 no. That is, that's not me. And (laughs) often it is because of the continuum, but also it is often because I intuitively know that left to my own devices, that's where I would go. Mm -hmm. And we don't like to admit that. (laughs) Like we're like, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want that. Or I'm like, ah, I was trying to keep that hidden. Mm -hmm. I didn't want anybody to know that about me. And now there is this three page description. That's everything that I've been trying to keep hidden from everybody for so long. Mm -hmm. And so that is that common experience. And back to that idea of we grow the most when we look at the parts of ourselves we don't like. Mm -hmm. And so that's what is so powerful about it. And The other five to 10% of people um, that find their Enneagram type, they're almost all sevens, which we'll get to the sevens. Uh, (laughs) And they're like, this is great. I don't see any problems with this. (laughs) 
until they start digging a little deeper. But yeah, so if you're new to the Enneagram or, um, you know, you've just started to dig in or you're like in the middle of this podcast, Googling it, trying to find information and you read your type and you're like, oh, wait, are you experienced a little bit of shame or a little bit of like, oh my gosh, I didn't know, know that you're totally normal. Mm -hmm. And that probably means you've hit on your type. That's mm-hmm. another good indicator of like, Ooh, that feels too close. And mm-hmm. that means it hurts probably right on there. <laughs> yeah. I hate to admit it, but it's true. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I think that was it for me. I mean, now that you put it in perspective, it was, it was hitting too close to home, you know, it was like resonating too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't like that. So Refusing much. not to believe it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, love it. Okay. So um, since we only have like, what, 10, 15 minutes to talk about this, I really would love for you to go through the different types and looking at them from the perspective of speaking mm-hmm. or presenting in front of an audience and maybe touch on the weakness and the strength for each yeah. type, if if that's okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, first of all, as speakers, you know, Chila's a speaker, I'm a speaker. If you're listening to this, you either are or want to be. Um, One of the things that is great about speaking is that you bring you to the table. Mm -hmm. And so wherever you go, there you are. (laughs) And so you are the component and you've got some really great things that makes you different. Like Chila and I could both speak on conflict resolution and we would come about it very differently because we are different people. And so know that your personality is just part of that. It's part of who you are and learning how to capitalize on those good things about your personality and the things that you can watch out for can really create you into and cultivate your speaking craft and your ability to connect with your audience, the way that you communicate information, because that's what we're all wanting. We're all wanting to think about how do I help my audience and how do I communicate this? So they're the ones that are taking it away. And that's how we help people as, as speakers. We're always going for that direction, but you can't hide behind the podium. Otherwise there's no speaker. So you got to show up as yourself. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so I like to start. So the Enneagram is divided into nine different personality types. So if you think about them, like a circle, like a clock, instead of 12 numbers, there's nine. Mm -hmm. And I like to start just to the left of the top at the eights. And so we're going to go around eight, nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So don't freak out if you're like, why, why, what? I I just, (laughs) it's not chronological. Help me. But for the perfectionist, this is for like, why are we starting with these? That's why I (laughs) always set it up that way. We're starting with the eights for a couple of reasons. And one is because eights are the most intense numbers on the Enneagram. And they are like, tell me it, I got to go. So you're probably already like, why are you chit chatting ladies? Like get Mm -hmm. to the point. And so that's why we start with the eights. It's, it's my way to honor them. So Enneagram eights are deeply motivated to protect themselves and others. They are super high energy, um, very intense. They're not high energy in this, in the way that you have probably experienced me as high energy already. (laughs) They are intense energy intensity. And that Mm -hmm. is, that is their thing. They're very intense. And in that motivation to protect what they're really not wanting is to not be betrayed. So Mm -hmm. they know their information. They want to make sure that they are correct and right. And they like to think about what's next. So as a speaker, they often come with great authority. So they stand on the stage and they know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. And the audience wants that. They want us to know, they want to know that the speaker on stage has got them. And so when the, when an eight comes on stage and they have the authority, there's a little bit of like, okay, I can relax. It's fine. And so that is a, that is a superpower of the Enneagram eight. The thing eights need to watch out for something that can be challenging for them in that fear of not wanting to be portrayed, they can turn into kind of um, sometimes a bullhorn Mm -hmm. in their speaking, like this is what we're going to do. And this is how we're going to, and it can be (laughs) a little too intensely in, it's not even instructive, but just like demanding of your audience. Could it come across maybe as aggressive a little bit? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So (laughs) rather than that demand, you want to invite your audience Mm -hmm. into Mm -hmm. this, you're co-creating an experience with an audience. So invite them in. And the other thing that eights need to watch out for is that question and answer time, the, the wait time for an eight, because they They've understood the question and like, have you, do you have any questions? Okay, great. And they kind of move on and everybody's still processing the intensity Mm -hmm. and the content. So maybe having a few questions prepared, picking somebody and saying, Hey, just tell me what your question is, can loosen up that question and answer Mm -hmm. time that makes 
it feel less intimidating for the audience to like approach the authority. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and that's Mm -hmm. a way you can co-create that experience Mm -hmm. for for Enneagram eights. Yeah. I do have a question. Ma'am. Maybe this is something you will touch on once you get to my number. Mm -hmm. But I do see some things that are similar in me as a three. Is that something that's true? Yes. (laughs) Or with an eight. Yeah. So here's what's interesting about the Enneagram. We're just covering like this. We're, we're kind of having a little trail mix, like quarter pop, (laughs) like there's little packets. That's what we're doing Mm -hmm. here. We're not having a full meal. Um, And so when you dig to the next layer deeper, there's another, there are other groupings in the Enneagram. So there are some similarities you will find because they share a common, what's called stance or posture toward relationships. So three, seventh and eights share a lot of things in common. Ones, twos, and sixes share a lot of things in common. Fours, five, and nines share a lot of things. So that's what you're feeling. You're Mm -hmm. feeling that connection. Okay. There's another layer that's also um, where you reach to in stress and where you go to when you're feeling like you're growing. Mm -hmm. Um, That's another layer of the Enneagram. So Mm -hmm. sometimes you feel a connection to those numbers as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And and so as you go through, remember, there's always one that's just driving the bus. Otherwise you'd Mm -hmm. have chaos. So they're all there. Yeah but you'll experience that. Does that answer? Which is what, yes, absolutely. Which is what I love about the Enneagram that it doesn't, it doesn't feel like it boxes you in. Like it doesn't like just label you like, here's your one thing. And then um, I I love all those layers. Yes. Yes. It's like a really super big wedding cake. And we're having like a tip of frosting today. Yes. Yes. (laughs) I know. I know I'm asking a lot of you. (laughs) So next to the Enneagram eights, then we move to like the top of the clock to Enneagram nines. And Enneagram nines are very um, observant and connecting. So Enneagram nines are great at explaining all the different viewpoints. And it's because they're deeply motivated by connection and they're very afraid of conflict. Like Mm -hmm. conflict is a core fear for an Enneagram Mm -hmm. nine. So they merge a lot with other people's ideas Um, Like, I guess that's what you think. So I think that too, that can be a real Mm -hmm. challenge for an Enneagram nine, because if I have conflict with you, then I lose connection. And that's what Mm -hmm. I'm afraid of. Mm -hmm. So as they're always looking for that. And so for nines as a speaker, what they're great at is building that consensus, Mm -hmm. like, because they're connecting with their audience, they're kind of sharing different points of view. They're really great at nuance. And as a speaker, sometimes we we don't want a nuance. We just want clear and move on. And so nines are really great at topics that require nuance. And mm-hmm. um, they tend to be storytellers and all of those things are really powerful about Enneagram nines. The two things that nines need to work on and just kind of watch out for is one in their stories. They don't always come to a point. Mm-hmm. They can kind of trail off and be like, so, you know, and then move on. And so <laughs> working on making sure your story has a point to it. We always mm-hmm. want to tell stories. Like that's a key speaking yeah. tool, but why am I telling that story mm-hmm. and know where it ends and where you're going is really yeah. important. Yeah. And the other thing for nines is to have your opinion and, and stake your claim on it. That can be very scary for nines. And if mm-hmm. nines listening, they probably just have like a little moment, like, uh, <laughs> so your take on the topic is why they've brought you. So you're not just there to share everybody else's ideas. What's your idea? What's your mm-hmm. point of view and discovering yeah. that and sharing that can be fearful for a nine or create mm-hmm. that fear, but it's such an important skill as a speaker. And, and that yeah. really helps a nine um, bring some life to that nuance that they're so good at. So that's yeah. their nines. Yeah. Makes and sense. That Enneagram ones are our next number. So we've kind of come around and Enneagram ones are really motivated by doing it right and good. And mm-hmm. so they are deeply motivated by making sure they're in alignment with whatever the rules are. Mm-hmm. And so what the rule says is where I'm going. And they have an incredibly strong internal critic. We've all got that internal Regina mm-hmm. George that's kind of berating us a little bit. Sometimes they have taken up residence and have full like uh, <laughs> mortgages going on in the house. I hear on you. The one's <laughs> mine. So they're very, very intense and they're kind of rem- moving the goalposts all the time. So they're always trying to get to that mm-hmm. perfection to quiet that inner critic. Mm-hmm. So as speakers, what's great about that is they're always going to know their information. They're always going to have details because sometimes people walk away from a speaker and we're like, I mean, I kind of know what they said, but I don't know <laughs> what what were the points? And, and so 
ones are incredible, like walking people through here's why, what, how, like the Mm -hmm. details of things are really important. And Mm -hmm. a one comes to that very naturally. Mm -hmm. And so for one, the things they kind of want to watch out for is most people need about a quarter of the amount of detail that you want. (laughs) And so if you look at your overall presentation or your script, whatever you're doing, think about taking out, just start with like one quarter Mm -hmm. and then go back and like a little bit more, maybe get some feedback from somebody because the amount of detail people can get lost. Mm -hmm. And so if you as a one want all that detail, know that you have it. If somebody asks a question and that sometimes helps ease that anxiety of like, Mm -hmm. I don't have to share it all. Mm -hmm. And so give them about a quarter of the detail that you think they need and then let them ask for more. And again, that creates that connection because you're back and forth Mm -hmm. and you're creating that trust of like, I'm not going to overwhelm you, but I have it if you want it. Mm -hmm. And that's what's great for a one. Love it. Love it. So then we move to Enneagram twos. So we're a third of the way. Okay. So Enneagram twos (laughs) um, are fantastic connectors. They are the helpers. They want to connect and support other people. And they're the trouble as a personality type is that they're doing that in order to have relationships. So Mm -hmm. I kind of have to earn my way in. And so if I help you, then I become indispensable. And Mm -hmm. that can, that's the struggle for the Enneagram two as a personality type. And as a Mm -hmm. speaker, what that means that's so positive is they automatically connect with their audience. Everybody feels this connection because they are so good at eye contact and looking at this person and want to make this person feel welcome. And like, there's so much deep connection, which is, I mean, what we want as speakers, Mm -hmm. what can be challenging with that very warm communication style is that people are feeling something, but they're not totally sure if you know what you're talking about, because if you go too far into that warmth and flattery, Mm -hmm. it can feel like you're like, wait a second, do you know what you're talking about? (laughs) Do you like, are you just trying to make me feel good? I mean, I feel Mm -hmm. really good, but now I'm wondering if it's too much, it can Mm -hmm. feel, feel like too much. Mm -hmm. And so making sure that you um, still connect with people, you make that eye contact, but just dial it back just a little bit. And the other thing I always want to remind it to is that you will never have everybody. And that's really hard as speakers because we're like, I want to win everybody in the room, but there's Mm -hmm. always going to be the bully in the back. And you can't let that person impact the care you've got for the other 99 people Mm -hmm. in that room of 100. So if you concentrate on that one person, you're going to get off your game and not tell your stories mm-hmm. in the right way. You're going to forget because you're so focused on that person mm-hmm. in the back. Mm-hmm. Your worth isn't dependent on the bully in the back. Yeah. And that's really important for twos to remember. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm a wing too. Mm-hmm. And so that was something at the beginning of my speaking career that I had to learn to get a thicker skin and remind <laughs> myself that even if I say it the right way and say the right stories, there's going to be somebody in the audience that's not going to like my style not going to like what I have to say. Don't think that I should be up there, whatever. And I'm not here for them. I'm here for the person who needs to hear from me. And so that was a tough one. Yeah, it is <laughs> And then hard. funny, because sometimes, you know, you're when you're on stage, someone can come across as they can look intimidating or feel like they're not really into it. And then that person comes up at the end and like, I loved it. It was so good. And I'm like, <laughs> <Yeah>. really? <laughs> it didn't look like it's you your thinking it. face. I have a really intense thinking face. Exactly. So and the thing is, you know, that. that that's actually an indicator many times that people are really are into it. Mm -hmm. If they're distracted is when the time you're like, you should be questioning if, you know, like they're into it. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, and so this wing Chila is talking about, it just means the number that's next to your core number. So Mm -hmm. everybody's got numbers on either side because it's a circle. So Chila's Mm -hmm. core number as a three. So she's got this two wing, but as a three, threes are probably the most natural speakers. They're the people, Mm -hmm. probably the most natural who can get up and talk about what they Um, know what they sort of know. Threes are often instant experts and they are motivated to make sure people's opinions of them are good and good Mm -hmm. because they want to earn that award. They want to achieve that 
worth because their idea that the personality is telling them that if I don't achieve, then I'm not valuable. Mm -hmm. Just like the two was like, if we're not connected, then I'm not valuable. Mm -hmm. So that's the threes personality struggle. And so that comes across and speaking is great because they're like, you need me to be this. I can absolutely be that for you. I can deliver. <laughs> I can deliver. And so the the three is very good at reading a room as well. Mm -hmm. Twos are good at reading one person at a time. Threes are great at reading the room. So all of that is an incredible speaking natural ability. Mm -hmm. One of the things that threes need to watch out for is that sometimes their desire to um, demonstrate that they know what they're talking about can start to come across as a little arrogant mm -hmm. and then, and it separates them from the audience because my friend, Sally always says perfection kills connection mm -hmm. and threes are not perfectionists, but they kind of can come across with this. I don't want to tell you my faults because mm -hmm. then you might think less of me. And then yeah. that kills the connection between you and the audience. And so you want to make sure that you aren't so far into believing your own hype that you set yourself apart from the audience that they can't connect with you because mm -hmm. then they can't hear your message. So that's the thing that three has got to watch out for. Oh, it's like bing, bing, bing. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. No, no, this, I need to hear it. I need to hear it. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Oh. So, and sometimes threes, uh, I mean, I haven't seen this in you at all, Chila, but sometimes you can tell a three and it, if I'm honest, there's a specific gender that struggles <laughs> with this, um, that they just come across. I as wonder. Real, I know <laughs> they come across as real slick mm -hmm. and, and you're just like, now I feel like I'm getting sold a used car. Mm -hmm. So just be careful that mm -hmm. you're connecting with your audience and you're coming from yeah. a heart of service, yeah. um, and not wanting them to think well of you, but rather mm -hmm. I want them to be served well. And that yeah. helps reset your mind as a three. Mm -hmm. really and easily. oh my goodness, now it's making all so much sense because I feel like I'm constantly going back and forth between that dance of like the two wing of me, like the connection and vulnerability and too much vulnerability and whatever. And then going to the other side where it's like, I've got this, like, mm, I'm the expert, whatever. And like <laughs> that constant back and forth, you know, it's just, yes. yeah, I can totally see it now. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Now, you know, but I think what you have done is you've made a career out of making sure that you're serving your audience well. And that, that is what shifts the, that's definitely a pursuit for sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then we've got Enneagram fours and Enneagram fours are, they have lots of different names that people have named them, but I always think of them as the romantic individualists and they are deeply concerned about knowing their own intrinsic value. And they're afraid that they're going to come up short. And so they're, they're inward and not inward, like it's, they're all int introverted, but they're very much um, self-referencing in the way that they approach their personality and this structure of, Ooh, it, am I being authentic to myself? Because if I'm not, then what if I don't have what I need? And that that's their push pull. And so as speakers, they're very good at the difficult topics where other speakers will kind of brush over things that are hard. Mm -hmm. Fours will welcome that in mm -hmm. and they really connect with an audience well, because they are so willing to share their vulnerabilities and they're so willing mm -hmm. to share their struggles and pains. Um, and that does connect them with an audience and they tend to be really good storytellers. Mm -hmm. What can be hard for fours is because they so relish the bittersweet, the nostalgia, even the negative emotions, like whatever emotion it is, make it bigger, mm -hmm. um, is kind of the fours MO that can be really hard for an audience who wasn't prepared for that. Mm -hmm. They're like, whoo. And that could feel like oversharing. It could feel like trauma sharing. It's just to be aware mm -hmm. of what's the feeling that the audience needs to have at the end, not the feeling that I want mm -hmm. to have at the end. And that, mm -hmm. that can be tricky for force. Yeah. yeah. And I have sat through a couple of presentations like that, where I felt like I was slightly traumatized by the <laughs> end. And I was like, this was a really, really heavy story. Like, I'm like, mm, I, I want you to be honest and vulnerable, but there are certain parts that can be left out. It's all good. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And that yeah. is the balance mm -hmm. for a four. And so I think that question of what do I want the audience to feel at the end helps guide how much, mm -hmm. how much detail you share, how you even end. Cause you can bring somebody into that deep space and kindly and gently walk them back up. 
Mm. you know, and so being aware of that emotional pattern or emotional journey you want to take them on, it can be really, really helpful. Yeah. Ian Cron is a four, he's an Enneagram teacher. And he talks <laughs> about, he was like, I realized that not everybody loves a funeral. <laughs> I didn't want to leave a keynote feeling like they've been in a funeral, which I just thought was the best Enneagram four statement. Yeah. That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. I don't think you can ever go wrong with starting with a mindset of what does the audience need? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. And that's a great segue into five. So the, the last three numbers are what we call in the head type and Enneagram fives are deeply motivated by wanting to know, like their knowledge base is so incredibly deep because that's how they keep themselves safe. They want mm-hmm. to know they are thinkers deep all the way through. And it's because they're afraid that somebody might need to know something from them. And then they won't know that deep fear of incompetence. And mm-hmm. so as speakers, they come with the data. And that is incredibly helpful. And it's not just data like PowerPoint data charts, like they know the connections, they understand what has brought me to this place through research. Mm -hmm. And that is incredibly powerful because sometimes we get these things that aren't rooted and it's like, it was a great story, but it's not rooted in teaching me anything or it's not rooted in reality. And Mm -hmm. fives are very good at bringing that rooted nature to their Mm -hmm. presentations and and talks. What fives can overdo sometimes is give people so much or assume a level of content knowledge that the audience doesn't have. And that can be really tricky. And so fives, I'm always wanting to help fives get toward what I call um, intellectual empathy. And it was coined by somebody else. I did not coin that term, but that intellectual empathy, meaning what did it feel like when I didn't know something new Mm -hmm. and it was Mm -hmm. new to me, which for fives is a core fear. So they very much know what that feeling is. Mm -hmm. And if I can explain or make sure we have the right schema or everybody's on the same page that we're not jumping into a treatise or a doctoral dissertation, unless that, you know, you're defending Mm -hmm. your doctorate, then of course, but (laughs) you know, like if you're just speaking, practicing that intellectual empathy of remembering what it felt like to not know, and Mm -hmm. that increases your opportunity to really bring the audience in and connect with them and bring them into your deep knowledge without being incompetent, which is what they're kind of afraid of. Mm -hmm. It's funny because um, my husband is a five on uh-huh. the Enneagram and he works in the medical field. He is in cardiology. And so he's very much, uh, I mean, he needs it for his job too, but he always makes fun. He's, uh, he's saying like, I would make it big in teaching other doctors how to do presentations because the presentation can be so uh, data saturated that it's just like people tune out. Um, yeah. It's, yeah. I wonder, do pe- are there certain industries where like certain types of enneagrams are drawn more? Like I'm thinking of, you know, like the medical field, probably a, a five mm-hmm. is someone who's naturally kind of like eases into that. I don't know. Yeah, no, you'll absolutely find different concentrations of different types and in different industries because it, it naturally goes to their strengths. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean somebody yeah. can't do it in that industry, but as an Enneagram seven, which, you know, we'll get to my type, no one should ever want me personally, this seven to be an accountant and work with <laughs> spreadsheets consistently. That's without any other thing. And I don't mm. know, I personally don't know any sevens that would thrive in that, but mm-hmm. there might be, sure. but so you're probably not going to find that because it goes so against what we're naturally gifted mm-hmm. at, which is good. Like we need, that's why we need all the different types and all the different motivations and, and we need yeah. everybody's differences. Mm-hmm. Um, quick last thing for fives. Don't be afraid to tell a story and contextualize your data because your data with a story makes it sticky. So mm-hmm. don't be afraid to tell a story. And then we move to Enneagram sixes and Enneagram sixes are deeply motivated to stay connected with people in a way that is about loyalty, that is connecting to being prepared and helping the community. And so they're always wanting to be prepared because they don't what they're really afraid of is getting blamed. So Mm. they really want to avoid blame and emotional and physical isolation. And so in order to do that, they prepare really well. So Enneagram sixes are never going to wing it. They're going to always come up with some practice and they're always going to know what they're talking about. And they can be um, shy and awkward 
sometimes. And so what I love about sixes is every six I personally know, and I've read this other places, but every six I know is funny. Like mm. they've got this like self-deprecating wit- witty. And a little bit humor. of sarcasm. A little I have bit a of sarcasm. Absolutely. <laughs> and it's not sarcasm that is biting. It's mm-hmm. a little bit of like self-deprecating. self-deprecating. Mm-hmm. I'm inviting you into this kind of funny yeah. space. And so with sixes, I'm always encouraging them to name the awkward just name it. Your audience will go, Oh, right. That's what that is. And then everybody feels comfortable again. Mm -hmm. And you aren't wondering if they don't know, you're not going to wonder if they're, you're going to get blamed because you didn't tell them something and everybody Mm -hmm. just name the awkward. And that can be really really powerful for sixes. Um, the other thing about sixes is sixes tend to be is very emotional. So their emotions are often really close to the surface, which is not bad in, um, in connecting with their audience. You need that emotional connection. But always be aware of I being in control of your emotions because you don't want to like be so extreme that now I've alienated my audience. Mm-hmm. Not that I'm not somebody who thinks that you shouldn't ever cry, but you definitely shouldn't break down. So make sure that mm-hmm. you have that emotional regulation and you you know the parts of your story that are going to make you tear up and practice them enough that you can tell them still being connected to the emotion, mm-hmm. but without the emotion taking over. Over. Mm-hmm. Um, and so those two things just kind of name the awkward and make sure you know where your emotional pieces are. And that can be really helpful for sixes. Mm-hmm. Love it. And then our last number, we've made it all the way around the circle, <laughs> is Enneagram 7. Um, and an Enneagram 7 is deeply motivated by avoiding pain. And mm-hmm. on the surface, it's very much what's next and what's joyful and this kind of veracity for life, the joy de vie, you know, that mm-hmm. all of that is what it comes across. But it's deeply motivated by wanting to avoid pain and being limited. And so threes and sevens are probably the most natural speakers. And so sevens are natural storytellers. They connect you to the, um, they usually also have a point, even if it's just a punchline, like they're really good at telling a story and getting you going. Mm -hmm. Um, They also are somebody that you can kind of just hand a microphone to and say, Hey, can you talk (laughs) for 20 minutes about this? And they'll go, sure. (laughs) I can do that, you know, and now even introverted sevens can, can often have this way of being Mm -hmm. able to do that. Um, and so that's really that confidence again, like we were talking about an eight that owns the stage and authority, a seven who is feeling like, yeah, here I am. Let's do this thing. Let's go. Like kind Mm -hmm. of pipe pipery Mm -hmm. is really comforting to an audience. Um, they're entertained. They feel the emotions. They often tell stories, which again, makes your point sticky. You know, all of that is really great. What sevens really have to work on is rehearsal because sevens will resist practicing because it feels limiting. Mm -hmm. Um, But what practicing does, what that rehearsal does is it makes you much clearer in the moment and you are less likely to share a random off, you know, something that you shouldn't say Mm -hmm. or something that is funny to you in the moment, but might not help the audience Mm -hmm. because sevens are really good at like, Oh, look, there's a squirrel. Oh, that was so great. (laughs) Anyway, I was saying, and everybody else is still on the squirrel. Mm-hmm. And sevens are like, why, why wasn't the audience with me? Well, because you took them there and you didn't bring mm-hmm. them back. Yeah, yeah. And so that rehearsal resistance <laughs> can be the thing for seven. So making sure that you've practiced, you know what you're talking about will be the best way to help you overcome that, but lean into those natural, joyful storytelling components of the yeah. personality type. Mm-hmm. Awesome. There. We did all of them. My goodness, you did such an amazing job. Like, I just feel like I have so much better understanding. Um, and it was so helpful. Like, uh, what are the strengths? What to look out for? Thank you so much. Yeah, You're so welcome. Love You're it. so welcome. Um, again, I could sit here and talk to you probably for another hour. <laughs> I'm trying to be mindful of my audience. So as we wrap up, there are a couple of questions I always ask everybody, you know, who I'm talking to. and I didn't send you these questions. So I'm kind oh. of like putting you on the, on the spot here. It's all right. I'm a seven. I'll be like, okay. <laughs> you can go with it. You've done this for a long time. So, I mean, obviously, you know, you are already a speaker. You use it for teaching your content and growing your business with it. So you definitely understand the benefits of speaking in front of an audience. Um, I, I would love to know, um, where do you feel like in your industry or in business building or how you, how you do things, where do you feel like you zig or zag 
where everybody zigs or zags. I never know how to ask that question the right mm. way. But where do you feel like you go against the grain? And you're thinking, you know what? Everybody kind of is going in this direction or the business world is telling us that, oh, this is the trend. You're like, you know what? I'm not going to hop on that trend. Uh, I'm just going to do it my way. Yeah. <laughs> I think the thing that I find that I am the most different is that I think that heavy topics can be talked about with joy. Mm -hmm. Like that just because it's a heavy topic doesn't mean we have to be serious. I can be mm -hmm. sober minded and joyful at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I've kind of started just to give up. If people think that funny shouldn't be a part of their corporate work, then I'm not your speaker. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. I am okay. Like if you are not willing to be curious and look into humor as part of our experience, then mm -hmm. we're not a good fit. And there are some people who are like, no, we need a thousand PowerPoint slides and it has to be information <laughs> only. And I completely disagree with that. I think mm -hmm. that stories are the way we learn. It's the way we should teach. So what my background in education, I actually started as a music teacher. So I will probably sing in a presentation just because I can't it's just part of who I am. <laughs> and so I can the, totally relate to that. <laughs> yeah. And then, so it's like, if that is not what you're wanting, if you have deemed that unprofessional, I'm mm -hmm. going to disagree with you and say, great, you need to find a we're different not, speaker. Yeah, we're not so I think that's where I, where I <laughs> zag when other people yeah. zig. <laughs> yeah. And I think you do such a phenomenal job of that, um, just from like interacting with you and seeing some of your clips. And I think that in honestly, in conflict resolution, I think that's so needed not to be so serious. And, you know, yeah. um, I think it's such a necessary part. So, yeah. and probably that's why you're so in, in demand, you know? Um, <laughs> and so, yeah. So I, you told me the other day that you, you have been out traveling and speaking in all these different places. Um, because I think we all need that. I think, mm -hmm. um, especially in conflict, conflict resolution. Oh, you gotta have a little bit Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, final question. Um, I'm a book, book nerd to the core. Oh. So I love <laughs> reading books. In fact, I literally have to limit myself of how much content I consume, but I would love to know <laughs> if there's a, a book you recently read that you would highly recommend or a podcast maybe that you're listening to oh um, anything you want to share a book, podcast, audio, audio book. Oh my goodness. There are so many. So yeah, I have to limit my reading goal every year because otherwise I would totally read mm -hmm. so, so many books. So I actually, this has a lot to do with the topic that I, um, I talk about it, when I am speaking with corporations and we're working on putting your values into your processes, honoring people, all of that. I think that Adam Grant's book, Think Again, is mm. actually really powerful because the way the workforce is today is not the way it was. Mm -hmm. The workforce was designed for white men who have people at home mm -hmm. caring for their families. And mm -hmm. that is not the world of work now. And I have raised a couple Gen Z, got a, two, a couple more in my house, but as they enter the workforce, their expectations about how work is different. And we can't, they're unmoldable mm -hmm. into something different. Work has yes. to flex and change. And so I think Think Again is a powerful book for really anybody. But when I really think about the power that book has to help us rethink how we approach conflict, how we approach employee relationships, employee engagement, how we approach leadership, gets us out of a fixed mindset into a growth mindset. Mm -hmm. I mean, Carol Dweck's famous book, Growth Mindset. I go on books about forever, but I think that's probably <laughs> the most recent book that I think is across every person's experience. You can really learn something from mm -hmm. how do I, how do I think, rethink something mm -hmm. when presented with new information? Yes. Yeah. That is, I can attest to that. It's an amazing book. I love um, Adam Grant. His writing is just mm -hmm. awesome. I read also originals from him. Mm -hmm. It's just, yeah, he's also like very well researched. So, it's, but he puts it in a way that it's understandable. It's easy to read. Um, so I, I will have that link. I, I do have that book. Um, and um, finally, how can, how can people connect with you? 
where can I send them to? <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. So to learn I, more from all the amazing things that you have to offer. Yeah. So jenwhitmer.com is my website. And if you go to jenwhitmer.com slash Enneagram, there's a little bit of description about the Enneagram and you can also mm-hmm. download um, a free resource that's got a short little video lesson and a downloadable that gives you all the nine types. It's much more detailed than we talked about today. Mm-hmm. So if you're curious and you want a place to start with the Enneagram and you haven't already Googled or you're overwhelmed with the Google that happened, go to jenwhitmer.com slash Enneagram and you can get this booklet mm-hmm. called Why Do I Keep Doing This? Um, and that will help you start to learn about the Enneagram, but also um, give you some tools like now what do I do mm-hmm. and and some um, helpful things that I'll, mm-hmm. I'll give you later as you start to implement the resource. Awesome. So um, on social, I play the most on Instagram and LinkedIn. I have a Facebook group and you can find all of that um, at the bottom of my, you know, you scroll to the bottom of the website, you see all the yes, socials. Yes, usually. Come find me there. <laughs> <laughs> Jen underscore Whitmer on Instagram and Jen Whitmer on LinkedIn. Awesome. Yeah, I will have the link to the Enneagram booklet and then also for your Instagram to make sure that people connect with you for sure. Wonderful. Jen, this was absolutely amazing. I, I knew, I mean, I, I just love hanging out with you. I think <laughs> I could listen to you like like with like a grin, you know? <laughs> It's like you bring so much joy. Um, but thank you for taking the time out of your day to come and share your expertise and knowledge with us. I know my audience is absolutely going to love you. So thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Chila.